Hello and welcome to Simon Miller's Pro Wrestling Show. My name is Simon Miller and yes indeed, this is a pro wrestling show. We're cranking out the episodes recently because there's just so much to talk about. And also, if you don't know, and I'm sure you do, but I'll remind you, patreon.com for Simon 316 is how I'm able to do all of this. It supports all my personal endeavors. And I thought, you know, a great way to get something back out of that was to invite patrons on this show because you get cool, different and exciting wrestling opinions. And eventually you'll get to know them too, as I have, because today coming back onto the show is my man Alex. Alex, how are we doing today i'm doing great how are you doing this fine thursday morning afternoon where you're at how's it going it's going good man i will point out that yes we are recording this on a thursday even though it won't go live on a thursday but that is the magic of the internet i have control over it all and i will actually pimp out as well to have a brand new podcast called why with simon miller you can check it out on youtube itunes google podcast spotify anywhere just search for it and you'll find it let's move away from that and talk about some wrestling uh, we start on some controversial, uh, well, just some controversy, I should say. Alex, my friend, have you seen everything that's been going on with Lars Sullivan over the last 48 hours? We're really over the entire year, but we'll focus on the last 48 hours. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm caught up a little bit. I saw some things, you know, with the news, it's sometimes hard to find the, the genuine reporting from the crap. And sometimes I see things like, I think Wall A apparently came out recently and said that and had some negative things to say about Lars Sullivan and his comments and everybody coming out of the woodwork saying that it's horrible and it's deplorable. And if it's true, then he'll be judged accordingly and stuff like that. Yeah, and that, that's what I wanted to talk about as well. Like if we go on the assumption and again, I know that there are people relating it to Lars Sullivan, but there is no as far as I'm aware, no a hundred percent this is definitely definitely him even though it seems very likely i'm not going to sit here on a, a public show and say that because we don't know that that ends up very badly <laughs> that ends up very badly indeed but for the sake of this conversation let's go with the idea that he did right well, again the best thing you can do is just go over to uh well any your, your wrestling news site of choice and there will be some articles about it but the the headlines are that apparently Throughout his time on social media and the internet and forums, Lars Sullivan has said some very, again, allegedly said some very, uh, well, bigotry and racist and sexist and just bad things all around. And somebody tweeted this to Big E and Big E responded by saying, I, sh- I should get the tweet, really. I'll never find it now. But he was basically saying, you know, if true, he's going to have to deal with the locker room, you know, filled with... Um, a lot with, of African Americans. Well, exactly, yeah. Filled with these people that he's been taking shots against. Now, if they are all true, there is no excuse for it. I want to make that perfectly clear. Hopefully, everybody listening to this podcast knows my knows my demeanor and my and my thoughts on this well enough. But there is there is no excuse. I don't. Well, I do, no, I don't. There's no point in pretending otherwise. Maybe I'm just wrong. But even when people say, "Oh, but they were young," I'm still like, "Yeah, well, I was young once, and I never had these thoughts." So I, I, you know, <laughs> right. I, I, I find it hard to justify. I, I mean. You know, I understand that racism is often passed down. You know, if you're brought up in a racist household, it's very likely you too will be racist because when you're growing up and you're impressionable, that is what's going to happen. But there is still, there there is just, to me, it's a zero tolerance, a zero, a zero excuse thing. But what I will say is, I'm not saying, I, I, I never, I never will talk about somebody's job because I don't think, unless somebody works for me, I don't think it's my prerogative to decide whether somebody stays or goes. But what I would say is in terms of the human being, it's far more important that we educate than just ignore. And when I say ignore, I mean, it's all well and good kicking him out back into the world and, you know, going off to, to find something else that he can do, which I'm sure he would. But I would far rather as long as everybody within the company was cool with it, was that WWE tried to educate him. Because without that, without that kind of rehab or without that kind of rehabilitation process, all those negative thoughts and all those awful and controversial and wrong thoughts are going to go back out into the world anyway. And really, you need to stop that at the source. And the source is whatever Lars Sullivan thinks. And again, maybe he did mean those things back in the day and he doesn't anymore. But... I, again, I don't know what the truth and what what's not the truth. But if he does still think that way, that's what I would implore everybody to, to hopefully try and do, to send him wherever you can, you know, I don't know, do whatever whatever is in, within the means of your power to let him know that thinking this way is awful and wrong. Agreed. You know, that that's, that's my take on it. I think we're so quick, and I understand it's a reactionary thing, and especially if you're mad and you're upset. It, it, it's very easy. I'll oh, fire him, fire him. And maybe he should be fired. You know, maybe that is the right thing. I'm not saying that it's not. I'm saying that in a, in a grander scheme of things, 
We've got to teach people that this stuff is bad. Otherwise, they just go and do it again. And that's no good. It's just no good. Well, I think of it this way. You know, you've been talking recently about how the people that pay WWE's TV rights, NBC, Universal, and Fox, they're starting to come out of the woodwork. Or There's news about they want the brand split to end, which I do not want to happen. And they're kind of forcing WWE's hand. Um, something like this with the current you know, political climate that it is now in England and in the U.S. with you know, racism still amok, I can see that as the only way that really WWE forces its hand to terminate Lars Sullivan because if the higher-ups at NBC and Fox just say, we don't want to highlight this individual because of his political views and stances and what he said, um, it, it's, it's tough because you have all these horrible things that he said on this, I think it was like a body – building forum on reddit or something like that and it's 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 tricky because we're also in a situation kind of to pivot away from that in we see like the revival who are clearly being punished on screen for it's you know turning down wwe contracts and how dare you turn down the contract you're gonna pay you're gonna shave his back <laughs> so it's one of those things where it seems like punishing talent on screen is detrimental to the product. Do you think that should be something that should be taken into consideration for Lars Sullivan? Oh uh, yeah. Pun- screen. Yeah. I, I don't want to, I, I the, the, the punishment, if that is the right word, I don't think needs to be him, you know, dragged over the coals uh, on TV because I just don't think that helps anybody. It makes for bad television because it's negative television and, you know, Mr. Positivity over here. But it's true. You can tell the difference between negative, negative and positive uh, TV. Hence why the, the, the revival thing, again, we've talked about this a couple of times, but the revival thing backfired massively on WWE because the, you know, the diminished viewership that are still watching know the ins and outs of the company. So everyone just thought to themselves, well, I know the revival didn't want to do this. I don't think the revival are stupid. They've just been put in this position because they wanted to leave. And actually, not something that we should have been talking about more is that they I thought they dealt with it very professionally they threw themselves into it they tried to make it funny it was like fighting a, an uphill battle but they did and that actually oh, no. that actually made me like them more I was like fair play Dash and Dawson you did your very best with something that was probably very hard to do once once you found out about it and if nothing else if you don't want them on television just put them on TV I know they're on Smackdown now but put the B team in there put heavy machinery in there put put some other tag team in that position that I can enjoy. And if you want to use the revival to get somebody else over, that's fine. That's your prerogative, again, as somebody's employer. But don't drag... And why, why did the Usos... The Usos had a terrible week, and it wasn't even their fault. They didn't do anything wrong, but they just got caught. I mean, I'm sure they don't want to run around talking about Usi Hot. Well, that was a terrible segment for the Usos, but at the very least, they did rebound, and they had a great match with Daniel Bryan and Rowan on SmackDown. I mean that's something. I'm not. I'm playing devil's advocate here, so. No, oh, of course. No, I love that match, man. I think that was one of my favorite parts of the whole week. And um, I wonder if the revival are looked more favorably by WWE higher ups and Sasha Banks, because at least with the revival, they said no. They're still on TV. They're doing the the horrible icy hot, oozy hot thing, and they're selling it like you would i mean it it did legitimately give me a chuckle i'm not gonna lie but i know that this is you, they're better than this they they deserve better than this but you know it is what it is but you know with sasha throwing her hissy fit and she's no longer on tv you know i wonder if vince looks at the revival more more fondly than sasha what do you think uh maybe i mean the the saddest story that I've read, it actually came out in the Wrestling Observer newsletter early, was about uh, the, the Luke Harper situation. Uh, as you mentioned that, I thought, oh, I, I should mention that. And um, I'm now mm-hmm. looking for it because the quote is far better than I can do it justice, but I can't find it. Uh, so essentially, it sounds like 
you know, Luke Harper went to Vince McMahon and said, and again, this is all speculation, but, you know, I, Meltzer usually gets it right when he, when he talks definitively about stuff. He went to Vince McMahon and said he'd like to be, you know, released from his contract in November. It then got frozen for six months because of the whole injury thing that they do. That if you are injured, they can freeze your contract. He then, re- uh, Vince McMahon told him to reach out to Triple H to sort it out. Luke Harper did. And as of yet, he hasn't got a reply. That to me is, you know, that, that to me is the hardest thing to... I think to stomach because when it comes to Luke Harper, I don't know what he did. Like what? what I don't know what he. To me, he was just been the consummate professional. Okay, maybe. Re- I've read reports about when he first got brought to the main roster. Vince wanted all of them to have Southern accents, and Luke did not. And Vince, I guess, had a grudge ever since. Maybe, man. I, I don't know. I just... I <laughs> under- that's like a Vince McMahon thing. <laughs> well, yeah, but it does. Like, I can understand there being a fallout of personnel. That happens in all companies. And if somebody in charge then wants to be, you know, wants to take action that way, okay, I can't stop it. But Luke Harper doesn't seem to have done anything. You know, it just seems he's worked up. Like, he seems like the consummate professional. Yeah. Uh, I think WWE also didn't like the the comment that he made on social media saying he was leaving think they prefer everything kept behind closed doors which in in this wrestling business that is so hard to do um i think it's it's just interesting because you know i think vince just has you know his favorites and his knots it depends on who he likes who he trusts and also who makes him the most money so you'll see (laughs) them be either quiet or positive about sasha or you know, Dean Ambrose on his way out, nothing but positive things because I think they drew money and they got a, there was probably a ticket viewership because of those two. Whereas the revival and Luke Harper, I what money are they drawing? At least that's my thinking. This is me trying to dive into Vince McMahon's mind. No, I think you're it's, right, man. It's it's it's, all, it's, it's it, it, you know wrestlers to Vince McMahon are commodities, and again, I'm not saying that in a disparaging way. They're still human beings, but he will look at them like that because it's a business. It's a business, exactly. I mean, just to sort of wrap up the Lars Sullivan thing as well. Apparently, that according from a WWE point of view, they were aware of the comments before he signed. He apologized to the company, uh, made it clear that he, you know he made a terrible mistake. And as far as, again, the, the pro, WWE were concerned, that was the end of that. Again, I don't know what's going to happen now. I don't know why Biggie decided to to respond to that to tweet specifically. Uh, I think he had every right to. And I think he, well, you know what he said was you know 100% correct. But there we go. That way, we've kind of mentioned everything. Uh, that, I'm, not there is to do about because I'm not too surprised with Big E because he's always been vocal about... Oh, he's great, isn't he? Yeah. ...social issues in the locker room. Like, remember when, the Ho- when Hogan came back? He was one of the biggest detractors of Hogan, saying, I'll forgive him when we have a frank conversation and we're able to discuss it man to man, which who knows what's going on with that. But yeah, Big E's been at the forefront of this for a while. No, I, I thought it, I, I think his attitude is is inspirational in many ways. Doesn't hold back. Is, is true to himself. And again, I think that's something that, that that we can all learn from. But there you go. That's the latest with the people that have walked out the door. I mean, you mentioned Sasha Banks. You know, she was internally noted down to go on the European tours, which they're on now, the WWE, obviously over here in the UK in a couple of days. Uh, she hasn't come. She's not here. So I would, I, I would imagine that she is in a Neville situation. And if you remember that, Neville just sat around for a while and then was quietly released. So I would presu- presume the same thing is happening here. Unfortunately, I'm not going, man. Is that what you said? Sorry, it kind of stumbled out. Yeah, I think Raw and SmackDown are in the UK. They're, just, they're in London. I was meant to be going, and this is a very sad story for me. I was meant to be going, and then I was reminded uh, I have a wedding on the Monday. Now, that's why I forgot who has a wedding on a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the reason it slipped my head, because when I decided to go, I was like, oh, yeah, nothing going on on that day other than the usual. I can I can switch some stuff around. And like I say, then I was reminded, oh, no, wait, that's that's the date of the random. And I'd already said yes yeah, so long ago. I was like, there's nothing I can do. You know, you can't. The, right. the sort of weddings is one of those like birthdays and you know even sort of just normal engagements you can get out of getting out of a wedding is like the hardest thing in the world so i just had to uh throw my um throw my my you know arms in the air and say eh, never mind it's uh it's one of those things but hey ho it'll, it'll be all good i can still i can still watch it the next morning i've been to oh. without one to like an asshole i've been to a lot of roars it's not like i'm gonna miss out on anything too crazy when they come over to the uk they often do very uh you know generic shows when they do come over yeah, judging by the latest Raw, uh, you're probably best not going. So 
I hope you have a better time at the wedding. What the <laughs> dude, dude, you tell me what you thought about uh, about the Raw. I know we've talked about it a lot, but look, it's correct. It's such controversy this week and sent some people proper crazy. I still think there's worth in getting other people's opinions. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to assume that you didn't like it, but what was your impression right after the fact? Because it seems like it was that 24-hour period where people were just like, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of it, and I'm not, I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm going to go out there and you know, stop my feet as much as I can. Well, to first and foremost, people saying this is the worst Raw in history, stop. No, it's not. Yeah, I thought that, yeah. yeah. I've, I've been watching since like 96. I've watched bad Raws. I was watching at the tail end of the cartoon era of the – you know, Duke the Dumpster Drozzy and Quang and all that stuff. So those those were bad, uh, especially looking back now. Quang. <laughs> yeah, Quack Quang. I can't remember. Um, yeah, those were bad. Um, the Sasha, the not the Sasha, the the Bailey. This is your life was dreadful. Um, that Raw was pretty dreadful. Actually, I went to a Raw last year. I'm I'm in Columbus, Ohio. So they had a raw in Columbus, Ohio. That was a bad raw. I was there. It was terrible. I couldn't tell you anything that happened on it, with the sole exception of Shawn Michaels and the Undertaker cutting a promo on each other on the way to um, the Australia show. Remember they were doing that build. That was a bad raw. <laughs> I, I, it was a bad Raw. The crowd really wasn't into it, except for Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker. And it was, which I think is part and parcel of the problem we have now, where we cheer for the veterans that can't really go anymore. We need to give our energy and our yays to to all the the new talent, the talent right now, the talent that are busting their butts day in and day out. Because they're, for all the faults that WWE has creatively, they have the best talent I think they've ever had. 80s, 90s, Attitude Era, they have some of the best talent, at least from an in-ring perspective. So we need to give more of our energy to them. Um, back to Raw this past week, um, it was... I think it hurts more because you have Vince at the start of the show saying, you know, I'm brilliant and I'm a genius and uh, all this other stuff. And this is going to be a raw. You'll never forget. Yeah, we won't forget. It was horrible. <laughs> he didn't lie. He told us the truth. I also think one of the big problems, and I'd like to get your take on it, as much as like I watched SmackDown and I was like, OK, the, 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 the wild card rule is not too bad. In the sense that, oh, here's AJ Styles. And I know he's only just been on SmackDown, but that ties into the ridiculous superstar shakeup. But it, it, it left me slightly intrigued. But then it also was quite clear as day that we're kind of screwed when it comes. Brand to, split's dead. The well, brand split's dead. But also, it, it kind of screws up like those under the radar guys that we all, and girls that we all like, that now may be screwed. I mean, my go to straight away was Shinsuke Nakamura and Rusev. I'm more of a Rusev guy than a Nakamura guy. But the fact that WWE has made them a tag team and we had. You know, a, a, a Shane McMahon segment saying, oh, who I'm going to crown tag team champs. And they didn't even, they weren't even booked to come out and say, well, we'd like to win it. They weren't even on the show. Like, they were just persona non grata. It made me realize, you know, guys like that, Buddy Murphy, for example, he made his SmackDown Live debut, but he made it for a WWE.com exclusive. And I, I, I think that's the biggest thing I'm worried about. Like, we need to create more stars anyway, but we don't need to run the current stars into the ground. And I know that's not necessarily going to happen because we didn't have a brand split for years and it was fine. But, it, it, it gave me a little bit of a, oh, well, that will suck. Because there are guys I'd like to see flourish. Cedric Alexander, for example. We saw Cedric Alexander on that first row after the Superstar shakeup. He lost, okay, so be it. But then we haven't seen him again. And it's kind of those guys, not necessarily Cedric Alexander and Buddy Murphy, but those guys that I haven't seen put in a top position before, that's the kind of change that I want. And if they suck, that's all right. Don't push them anymore. But at least give them the opportunity. And now there's going to be less room for that because... You're going to have to fit Roman Reigns on both shows, Daniel Bryan and both shows, AJ Styles, depending on what the plan is for that week. Baron Corbin. Don't forget Baron Corbin. Oh, man, I, I'm starting to feel sorry for Baron Corbin. <laughs> like, it, it, all, all he does is what he's told, and everyone, it's not his fault. 
He doesn't sound like to be on every, you know, part of the show. He's not going to say no. Who's going to say no? Baron Corbin's in a great position because he was put in a great position. And not that I'm saying that it's not, you know, it hasn't come back to bite everybody in the ass. It has. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I, the, when they teamed Bobby Lashley and Baron Corbin up on Raw, that for me was a real, oh, geez. At least do something different, please. The mid-card of terror. Yeah, it is. I mean, it really is. No one ever comes out of it, right? Just 50-50 booking, hanging around, sort of banging your head against the glass ceiling. Right, exactly. And, <laughs> I mean, it could have been – you could have really just put anyone – you could have put the Usos against them as as tweener heels. That would have probably been a better match. But, you know, that's that's fantasy booking for a Raw that we really want to uh, not remember. So – you know, it is what it is. But at least, you know, SmackDown was better. I really liked SmackDown a, he- a heck of a lot more. And I wonder if it's because a bad Raw will make an okay SmackDown better than what it really is. Yeah. And I, I don't want to crap all over the wild card rule just yet because I want to see where it's going to go. But- I will. It's, it, I will. It's dumb. It's not – it probably is – it's not going to last – in terms of actually them saying wild card rule, it's going to be like you know them say nine ninety nine over and over and over and over again. Eventually, after a few months, they're going to stop, and hopefully with this, they'll stop at some point. But by the time they stop, it will be no more quote unquote brand split. It's going to be Roman and oh all yeah, the- yeah, I think I think this is the start of all of that, right? And I get it. They're Ratings are tanking. They're getting they're getting desperate. They need to do what they need to do. They need to, I don't know, get on their hands and knees and beg for CM Punk to come back. <laughs> well, I mean, I can't see it happening, but you never know, right? You you, no. you never know. I, I I I he's one of those guys that I'm not saying in the future, but right now, I think to him he would see it as some kind of a, a moral loss. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I don't. I think even if he needed the money or something, I think he'd look for other. He'd look for other ways before he did that. Because I just don't think he likes them very much. But I can understand they fired him on his wedding day, took him to court, uh, basically broke up his his friendship with Colt Cabana. Like there's a lot of a lot of bad blood there, and I think it's probably going to take a huge shift on both sides uh, to, to ever make that to ever make that happen again. It, it's going to be interesting. It, we've got an interesting six months. Like nothing's going to change overnight. Uh, and I mean, the more interesting thing right now is. You know, AEW, I don't know how much this means to you, Alex, or if you saw the story, but AEW announced that Double or Nothing is indeed going to be on ITV box office over here. The pre-show is going to be on ITV4. That got a lot of people talking. ITV is the second biggest TV channel in the UK. Been around for ages. Uh, It certainly makes sense because they tried to air World of Sport throughout the last summer. Obviously, it was a UK promotion on there. Didn't really work. Didn't really, um, you know, pick up much traction, which was a shame. But this isn't, you know, this isn't being produced by ITV. You know, ITV put the money in for that. Obviously, the Khans and AEW are doing this. And if it does turn out that AEW have got into bed with ITV, just to give people that don't understand what that means over here, I mean, that's kind of like the Fox deal, I think, in America. With if you want to watch WWE, you need to buy Sky. Sky is quite expensive. I think it's a minimum of like twenty-five quid a month. Uh, ITV is just there, and you can watch it whenever and whenever you feel. Obviously, the pay per view is on pay per view, but that to me is a huge shot because. I would imagine, I don't know the figures, but even if AEW did go on something like ITV4, I think that it would still outdraw WWE in the UK. I don't think that many people are watching on Sky. I know that was a whole deal when they were trying to rearrange their rights, which means you've taken, this, as some people say, the second biggest territory uh, you know, in all of, in all of the, uh, the world when it comes to wrestling. And from the gates, you can say, ah, we're bigger than you. And that, to me, is massive. And it kind of ties into everything that's going on with WWE at the moment. And will be my go-to evidence, at least over here, when people tell me that AEW isn't a threat. No, not in terms of finances, but they're certainly making, you know, smart inroads. Yeah, I think we talked about this the last time I was on your podcast. We touched on it briefly. We need to be a little patient with them and kind of grow and let them develop into a weekly episodic television program for wrestling because... WCW took time. I mean, Ted Turner bought in the late eighties and it wasn't until, you know, they developed nitro and they went live and they got Nash and hall that all these things started to come together for them to a point where they were legitimate competition and they were beating 
WWE in the ratings consistently. It's history's kind of repeating itself because we have WWE in a lull ratings wise, and here's this upstart that's getting a lot of noise coming up. You know, it's it's going to be a this is a very pivotal year for WWE because you have AEW lurking. You have this new Fox deal where, you know, Fox is already telling them we don't want the brand split. They're starting to, you know, interfere with WWE workings. And I wonder what's I wonder what's going to happen, because if the ratings are like this on Fox, they will easily put them on, you know, Fox Sports one, which is going to hurt the ratings even more. And I'm sure there's probably some kind of clause where Fox will back out of the deal. So, you know, it's very interesting the way things are going. I'd be interested to see and compare the ratings right now to what the ratings were in that 95, 96 era of WWE when WCW was big and you had this horrible creative. Um, I wonder what it's going to look like. Do you by chance have any idea cuz i think you're a bit of a ratings guy as well do you know what in terms of aw do you mean wwe's ratings in 95 and 96 oh to- i see uh, I, mean, I don't know what they were i know that wcw was actually killing them um i mean we may be able to find out if we type in i mean i know they were so low people were worried that they were going to go out of business so, you know I, I certainly i certainly remember i certainly remember that but no i think just because that was the kind of the time where i was you know, first getting in, in, into wrestling and, and learning about it. Um, right. I mean, yeah, they're, they're similar. I mean, this is just something that's come up. You never know how true it is. But apparently they were doing stuff like uh, 2.1, 1.8, 2.6, 2.0. 2.0. So, you know, they, 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 were, they, they were literally about where they are now, which again, kind of sums up my talk. I know we repeat ourselves a little bit, but it does kind of sum up why I think AEW is so important. Some people don't agree with this. But we need a new WCW. And if that's going to be AEW, this is the right time because they need to come out, you know, they need to come out punching. I mean, the, the, so the, oh, I'm literally going to get the May rating up if I can actually, this is just all backwards though. This is a crazy way to put these, right to understand this at all. Um, so basically, but in fact, you, I mean. But you, can you see the symbolism that I'm talking about compared to now and then? Oh, ab- oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. It, it, it's, it's incredibly similar. And really, this is the, you know the 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 ultimate endpoint to not having any proper competition. You know when when you aren't pushed in the way that they were being pushed twenty or so years ago, and you have a monopoly over everything, it's probably really hard to you know to to, to g yourself up. So yeah, I I I, I, I don't know, that's not well, right. I, I don't mean it like that. But you know when you you can fall into a lull is what I mean without even realizing it, and that's what they've done. So they need someone to come along, come along and and shake everything up. I don't care who that is. You know, I don't care if that's you know if we're actually being shaken up right now because of the rating being so bad. We just whatever we have to do to get to a point where TV is good, long term storytelling is good, we've got stars, and everybody's interested in talking about it positively. Then that's what we need to do because otherwise we'll get to 2024 and we'll be in a, a difficult situation. I agree because we've seen as fans, especially you and me, we've been watching for a while. We see what WWE is capable of doing when their backs are against the wall. Vince McMahon's back was against the wall in the 80s, and when he bought the company, and look, he bought out the territories, he grew into a global phenomenon. Then the 90s came, and we saw bad ratings and horrible creative, but then WCW's rising, and what does Vince McMahon do? He, you know, some things happen. You have DX, you have Austin, Attitude Era, boom, right back into the stratosphere. So we've seen that WWE is capable of great wrestling television when their backs are against the wall. And we'll see if Vince is able to do it again. Yeah, well, we we certainly are, man, because he is the only person uh, that that is steering uh, steering this ship. And it does kind of tie into the XFL as well. I meant to talk about this other day, and I didn't. You know, the XFL have got a couple of TV ratings they announced too. I know it's not specifically wrestling, but it will affect WWE. And they're kind of going the other route. Now, they've got on Fox and ESPN... But they're, they're, they're no rights fees are being paid at all. So basically, you know, the, the, the networks are going to pick up the production costs, which are around about $400,000 a time. 
And essentially is Vince McMahon's way of saying over the next two to three years, I'm going to lose a lot of money. And I kind of respect him in one sense because I think he feels like that's a, a blemish on his name. And he's using kind of like the last, maybe in many ways, literally the last roll of the dice to try and try and right that wrong. And honestly, I do respect him for it. He is a man that refuses to give up. And I think that's something we can all learn from. Whether or not that is going to transpire into something successful, I don't know. But we certainly are, we are, certainly are going to find out. But yeah, I mean, basically giving away football for free, he, he, he's a renegade. And I think maybe that ties into what we, we need that kind of attitude when it comes to WWE, that gung-ho risk of, uh, sorry, non-risk averse attitude of doing something different. Because to me, and we are going to move on, I know we talk about the shows a lot, we will move on from, from a second. For me, the big thing is the show has been the same since the you know, mid-90s as we were just talking about. It needs a complete refresh. And obviously the look isn't going to change massively because it is a pro wrestling show. But the core and the foundations, I think, now just need to be torn apart, much like they were in 1997 where everything changed. Let's do that again. Let's come up with something new for a modern day there are you know there are glimpses here and there like i like the way that the miss shame at man angle was shot on raw it was a bit different and i enjoyed the ali promo again on smackdown again just these little different things but right now they're kind of the icing and it's the like i say it's the actual concrete we need to we just need we need a new recipe we need a new recipe yeah the sameness means you know if this looks the same as last week then why should i watch this week yeah exactly especially with no stories going on yeah I mean, we used to have it where every single pay-per-view looked different from an aesthetic point of view. We had Raw look one way and SmackDown look a completely different way from uh, the stage and the presentation. Um, that's what we need to get back to, and I don't want to hear it about the money thing. They're getting a lot of Saudi money, so they could clearly do this. Bring back Pyro too. <laughs> I was thinking the other day, well, I don't get why they don't bring back Pyro now. Before the reason was money, well, they've got the money. I think I think even little things like that would do wonders. I really, really do. It would make it would make people happy. And I think that's what they should be going after now. Just make people happy. Especially if you're gonna be on two different channels, two different rival um, television companies, I would assume they want their own input on uh, Fox would want their own input on SmackDown because you hear stuff that they want a more sports oriented product. They want to bring in, um, oh, who's the the MMA heavyweight champion to be a commentator. You know, stuff like that. They want Ronda Rousey on SmackDown and Brock Lesnar. Which, when I hear that, I'm like, oh yes, great, thank you, awesome. That's what I want to hear. That's what I want to see. You know, great wrestling. But you know. We still have a long way to go. It's going to be a very interesting six months, to be sure. It is. It is. And, dude, obviously, you know, you're still a WWE fan. Uh, you mentioned to me that you'd actually gone and checked out some shows over the last few months since we talked again. Give me, give me the rundown, dude. Let's, let, let's see how life compares when you're, you're in amongst it compared to watching it on TV. Well, um, amongst the shows, like, I'm just talking, like, the some of the WWE shows that I've been to all my life, like, I remember the first Raw I ever went to was uh, it was here in Columbus, Ohio. It was the night after No Mercy in 99. <laughs> I love it, man. Right. And all I remember was, you remember that show, Edge and Christian and the Hardys had a great ladder match? For yes, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Terry Runnels Services. <laughs> wow, yeah. But that was such a great match. The next night on Raw... They're both out in the ring, and every single person, 15,000-plus, got on their feet and gave both tag teams a standing ovation. And this is Edge and Christian and the Hardys. This is before TLC. This is before um, all the great ladder matches that would come before. And that was the very first one that doesn't really get talked about as a great ladder match. And um, I think... The Hardys were the new brood at the time, or they had just gotten out of it. So, <laughs> classic. Give, give you perspective on what was going on, and I, I, it was, you know, I remember that fondly. Being everyone, that was one of the louder, you know, claps and cheers that I can remember was that moment, and I just it gave me goosebumps, and I thought it was awesome. Um, another thing that I went to that was really cool was. Um, SmackDown, it was 2002, um, another thing I barely remember, but it was The Rock cut a promo against Booker T and Goldust, and Goldust is dressed like Booker T, and, you know, <laughs> The Rock. It's like a different world, isn't it? 
Yeah, exactly. The Rock doing his normal Rock thing. You know, why are you touching yourself? Stop touching yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it's. I thought it was funny. Um, the Invasion pay per view. You remember that, of course. Of course. Yeah. You went to that man. I was there. How was that? I, that was very. That was a fun show to me. I mean, looking back on it because of the invasion storyline, people say it was the biggest missed opportunity, and I get that. But the show itself was great because you had, you know, RVD and Jeff Hardy in a hardcore match, and, you know, that it's RVD and Jeff Hardy. So you know some crazy stuff's going to happen. Yeah. That's um, well, I, I, amazingly, in terms of wrestling, it's only just caught up to him. Like, I know he's had time away from wrestling due to various personal issues, but he never... Re- I, I know he hurt himself when he was on his, uh, his motorbike once too. But this is the first time I can remember him being injured wrestling and being out for a long time. Fair play to Jeff Hardy. I mean, I, how he managed to do that, I will never understand. Oh, yeah. All the bumps he's taken over the years. How are you now just... How is it now just finally catching up? I know. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Like, more power to that man. Uh, I agree. Absolutely. And, you know, he deserves our respect, absolutely, for what all that he's done. And he says he'll be back, and I fully believe he will. So, you know, fast recovery for him. And, you know, obviously the main event of that show was the Team WWE and Team Alliance, Team WWE, and, you know, Everybody was like, I can remember people cursing for Austin turning his back on the WWE and joining the Alliance and, you know, giving the stunner to Angle and Booker T covering for the one, two, three. You know, these are grown men cursing. (laughs) Well, yeah. I mean, also back then as well, it's a more adult product too. No two ways about it. Right. And we were just coming out basically the end of the Attitude Era. And I guess this is when the the ratings began its nosedive, I I believe. So, you know, that was also a cool show, too. And another one that I went to that I wanted to bring up was actually more recently. It was like 2015. And the Arnold Classic, you're a bodybuilder, so I'm sure you know what that is, right? Oh, I love the Arnold Classic. Yeah, if you don't know, it's like uh, but the best way to put it is for the people out there is it's Arnold Schwarzenegger's lol i'm gonna have fun with bodybuilders that's all it is and everyone loves it because it's arnold schwarzenegger putting it together it's great and it's cool and it's grown into this really amazing thing over the years but that's why it started it's like oh wait i'm arnold schwarzenegger i can do this and it's fine and he was right he could everyone was like yeah this is great arnie thanks yeah i was there and we were just hang- i was just hanging out with friends just going to the different tables and stuff and somebody had just given they were giving away free tickets i'm like free tickets to what and i was like wrestling show i'm like okay so I go and I see it, and we get there to the little uh, music venue that it was at, and it was NXT. And apparently, it was the very first NXT show, um, TV show that was taped that was not in front of Full Sail. So it's the first time they're on the road, which I thought was really cool. And this is when Kevin Owens is NXT champion, Sasha Banks is in her peak boss mode she puts over um the alexa bliss before she became what she is now this is when she was the pixie cheerleader thing and everybody was cheering for her and rightfully booing the boss but by the end of the match we were like you know sasha's ratchet no she's not (laughs) (laughs) um i thought that was really cool to find that out and that that was the first time NXT had gone on the road, and I thought that was really cool. Oh yeah, no, that's a th- I mean, right now as well, you know, the disparity between NXT and, and WWE is nuts. So to be a part of that, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of the rising tides when it came to that is is mad. Like it, it kind of feels like a different world to the point where they were just I wouldn't call them under the radar back then, but certainly still finding their feet. Whereas now they're more than established. So you know, you're part of history in many ways. Maybe exaggerating it a little bit, but. I think that's fair. Yeah. And like I said, like I went to Raw last October and Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker were in the ring cutting a promo in 2018. I mean, my goodness. That's cool. It is. Me. It is cool. But I, I've been thinking about this the last few days. I think it's those kind of decisions which have now ultimately brought us to where we are today. 
you know, this insistence of, and I love nostalgia. I'm the biggest nostalgia guy. So you can, I'm happy that people say, Millie, you're part of the problem. Maybe I am. But to not use those guys to create new stars, which is essentially what we didn't do. I know we did it with Roman Reigns and The Undertaker, but maybe it was too far. It, it, was, it was, you know, too far after the fact. It's just, it feels like, you know, a, a missed opportunity when we had all these guys that were kind of, not necessarily last year with Undertaker and, and Shawn Michaels, but before that, maybe even back in 2012, it's sort of mid-2000s, let's even say, to not try and use these people that you knew weren't going to be around ever to, to make Seth Rollins feel like a bigger deal or Dean Ambrose or Drew McIntyre, whoever you want to pick, now really is what has come back to haunt us. Because it's really, really true. Like I've got loads of mates that know about wrestling, but they don't know the wrestlers. They, they know John Cena, and some will know Roman Reigns. But outside of that, they just they don't know. They don't they, they don't know that the names they all gravitate towards are the names from the past. So, for example, when Goldberg was announced for the Saudi Arabia show, oh, I'd be like, oh wow, Goldberg's coming back, and it's just. For that to still be a thing in 2019 really is where WWE has gone wrong because you need your 2019 stars and we don't have them. As much as I hate to say it, or at least we don't have them outside of the bubble that we all happen to sit in. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. I mean, I get it. I mean, it worked for a little bit because I think what was the first one that it, it happened to? I think it was The Rock when he came back and he has those two WrestleMania main events against John Cena. You know, they drew a record number. They got a lot of money for those shows. You can, you know, debate the WrestleMania 29 and the rematch, which, you know, was basically the same match as WrestleMania 28. So it is what it is. But it did make them a lot of money. And now they're in this rabbit hole of, well, you know, attitude errors are the only guys that can draw money. So we've got to book them. And if they can't wrestle forever. They just can't. I mean, Ric Flair was 59 when he had his last match. I'm not trying to disparage Ric Flair or anything like that because, you know, I, I do appreciate all he's done, and I did enjoy him as a wrestler. But do you really want to get to that point with these guys? I mean, we're pretty much at that point with The Undertaker. I did not watch that Saudi match with him and <laughs> him and Kane against Triple H and Sean. I, that was like, no, Sean retired at WrestleMania in 2010. I'm, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yeah, and you have that right to, man, right? Like you, you can control that in many ways. Yeah, and I, I get it. It's money. A lot, they're getting paid a lot of money and it's hard to walk away from that money. But, you know, you're you're getting thrown through the you know, the wood chipper, metaphorically speaking. And I wonder if the ratings have something to do with that as well. It's just finally catching up that, oh, you're going to Saudi Arabia? You're taking their money? Nah, I'm not watching anymore. Oh, no, I think it had an effect, man. I don't know sort of the percentages, but I think you have to throw that into the mix when we're talking about it, which is why all of this bad press happening now, you know, a mere month away before they go back to Saudi Arabia is just is the worst possible timing. Uh, I'm amazed they're still going. I understand why, because, you know, money obviously speaks to them louder than, than other stuff. Yeah. But right. it, it, And I'm not trying to say that all these veterans coming back for matches is all bad. If they're booked properly, it can work out tremendously. You brought up Goldberg. Goldberg, Lesnar, and Survivor Series a few years ago. That was, oh, was amazing. great. Absolutely brilliant, right? Brilliant. I can't remember the last – that was the last time where I had this guttural feeling in my gut where I was just excited, and I was like, I have to watch Raw the next day. Exactly, I have right? to see how they come back from this, because how do you – how do you beat Brock Lesnar, the guy that defeated The Undertaker's undefeated streak, and you be, he loses in like a minute 26 to Goldberg? He has to he, – like he ha we were begging. He has to be on more. He – has to be on more. He wasn't, but you, you get what I mean. <laughs> but that whole thing with him and with Lesnar and Goldberg, and even the match at WrestleMania, five minutes, it was perfect length. It was great. Oh, I mean, it's, that it's, it's good. It was fantastic, man. Like it really, it really, really was. It was, it, it was genuinely, genuinely brilliant. And I think again, it does all tie in because the idea there was that we can keep Brock Lesnar potentially even stronger. So that when she, uh, so when he, you know, when Roman Reigns beats him, 
it will go to Roman Reigns. And yet we got to we got to WrestleMania and they decided, ah, we'll keep it on Brock. And I think that maybe is where and not the first, you know, dent in the armor came, but certainly one of the dents came. Because, you know, people were just just so shocked that they weren't going to pull the trigger on Roman. And then it was a double edged sword because they were sick of seeing Brock Lesnar as champion and it kind of went downhill from there. But I, I don't know, man. Like I, I need more of that Brock Lesnar Bill Goldberg stuff. And not necessarily with those two guys. I'm not saying being Brick Brock Lesnar and, and um and Goldberg back in that sense, but create that magic. And again, maybe I'm being a bit hypocritical, hypocritical here, not coming up with um, you know, a specific example. But that's the kind of magic that we need. Because when you when you have that and you like you said, it wasn't even a choice for you. You had to tune in. And you know, recently WWE said that they're going to, you know, not post as much stuff on social media. Again, probably a smart thing to do, but it's not the reason. Because if it, you know, you've been doing that for the last four or five years. And therefore you have to introduce something new to the equation to then be able to go, okay, it was that that we, you know, that we took a dip. So Well, if it were me, honestly, I just fire everybody in creative and just I would elevate the NXT writers and put them on the main roster and, you know, demote the rest and put them on NXT because NXT's works just fine. Now I understand it could be because they only have one hour of TV a week and it's taped. They're live for five and possibly going to be six hours a week for Ron Smackdown <laughs> every single week. I, I understand that, but it's just – I mean I don't want to speak ill about anyone. Because I'm trying to be positive like you. I'm a positive person. The only thing I could see that fixes all this, ultimately fixes all this, Vince just is gone. Vince steps down or – I don't even think he's ever going to step down. I think he's going to just – he's going to pass and then Triple H and Steph will take over. Is that the ultimate only way that we're going to see true change? Well, let's say that it is. Let's say that we do need that. We can also kind of argue there's every chance that Vince McMahon doesn't step away for another 20 years. Realistic. I mean, not realistically, I shouldn't say that, but, you know. He, he is at a jackhammer. But exactly. And, he, and his mum's still alive and she's in her mid-90s. And I'm sure they may get to a point where, you know, time catches up to us all, as, as terrifying as that is. But let's say that that does happen. And, and you know, we can't, get to, we can't get to a point within the next decade, let's say, where that transition happens. What do we do? What does WWE do? What's the, you know, what's the, what, what, what's the, 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 the goal? Uh, hopefully to modernize the product. That would be good. I hear little things about what AEW has planned and what they are going to do from uh, an aesthetic point of view and, what, how they plan to present the product, and I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm interested. I think one of the things I heard that they were planning to do different was um, the sky cam that you see in like football games. I think soccer matches as well. The camera over the stadium that like zips from one side of the stadium to the other. Wouldn't that be cool to see for a wrestling match? I mean, I, if not, I, I've said this before. If nothing else, it will surprise your eyes. And people forget how powerful that is. If you do something that makes someone go, oh, I've never seen that before, you're more likely to pay attention. Obviously, if what you then see is a bunch of crap, you tune out again. But it gives you it gives you that impetus to, to stay connected, whereas before maybe you wouldn't have been. So yes, I think that, that kind of stuff is important. And again, it would straight away make you go, this isn't 1998 anymore. We've done something different. Plus, you can also see with NXT, you see Triple H and the way he wants the NXT product to look. And consistently, it's just been top-notch to me. So you can see him wanting to do that, and you hear little news here and there that he's gathering his little writing staff together and just making sure that they're in the business so that when he eventually takes over, he has his writing staff and his creative ready. So you can see that it's going to happen at some point. And the way, if, if the way NXT is being booked, if it can mirror the main roster, if I'm getting tongue tied, but you get what I mean. That would be great. If the main roster can look like NXT in terms of the way, the excitement and everything, I think that would be fantastic. We want to support the product. Everyone can, you know, easily badmouth the company and talk trash and talk trash to you, whatever. 
eventually, but we're still wrestling fans and we still love the product because we're watching to this day, some of most of us. So you can see that we do want best for the company. We don't want bad things to happen to the company. And when ratings are dropping, we panic. We don't want to, we don't want anything bad to happen to the WWE because you and I, we lived through WCW going out of business and what a hole that was for the company for so many years. Yeah, no, I think, you know, if WWE died tomorrow, I think <laughs> so many people would go crazy because what are they going to moan about now? <laughs> it's all it's all gone away. And I think I, I think you've hit the nail on the head when you talked about NXT. You know, with, with numbers dwindling, you have to kind of compartmentalize everything that's going on, which means right now you've got to appeal to your hardcore fan base. You've got to get them back involved because if if not, you know, without that, you've, you, you've got nothing. So... You know, if they do like stuff like NXT, why not spring? You don't have to do everything. You know, it doesn't have to be a wholesale change in that sense. But why not sprinkle a little something in there just to see if it works? And if it does, then you can then you can run away from it. I think you know consistency is another is another massive thing for me. You know, yes. you know the Mojo Rawley stuff coming and going. I find really irksome because I don't know what I'm meant to buy into each and every week. And I, we mentioned Cedric Alexander being on some shows and some not. Uh, you it, know. It's a- sign when our favorite part of raw right now is firefly funhouse well I th- it's I th- not in ring that's the thing well you're, you're right but i think at least it creates that idea of well, what's he going to do next week and that's all i need it's not that it's not easy to create that but that's all i need all i need is what is he going to do next week and look that one hit his shelf life too you know you've got to make sure that you deliver something otherwise you, you just you know it's a bit like the um uh, what were they called? The fashion files. I know they weren't as interesting as, as this were, but it wasn't their fault. They weren't allowed to to, to pay it off. But eventually after we're like, well, I'm bored now because it's just the same thing every single week and you're not doing anything different. But whatever you need to do to start applying that to your right, to the wrestling ring, to the stories, to the superstars, to whatever, if we do that, it will become a much more interesting show. And maybe that's the problem. It's just not that interesting at the moment. You know, there's not that much to sink your teeth into. We have the same, like I said, the same things each and every week. And the belts aren't really... I think that's it. We've got to start focusing on the belts more. The easiest way to watch wrestling and describe to someone is what everyone's going after this belt. Okay, cool. But at the moment, I, it, it's I, not that. I put it to you, when you were doing your live um, ups and downs for SmackDown, I was in that chat, and I put a comment in there saying, wait and see... The WWE and Universal titles are going to be merged together by Survivor Series. Book it. They, I have a feeling they're going to unite a bunch of belts. I hope the, so. Why not now, right? If everyone's jumping to and fro, why the hell not? Exactly. Why not? Why do you need two top titles if you're going to have rosters for both, on both brands anyways? You may as well have one belt. I liked it with one belt. I don't mind... I still would prefer the brand split and you have your top champions given right to go back and forth as they so please because it worked for The Rock back in 2002. I mean, he had his match with Brock Lesnar and they're building to that, but also he's fighting Triple H on Raw. That was great. It can work. It's just... Uh, it's back to creative. Yeah. We don't trust. I don't trust WWE creative. I do trust NXT creative. Exactly. They need to buy. They need to build that trust up again, where you know you're allowed to buy into this, and we promise you that we will pay off on it, which is a huge yeah. thing. Because look at it right now with the undisputed era. They're they're splintering amongst each other and fighting on NXT, and most, at least I personally, do not want them to splinter off. I would like them to stay you know, a group, but it's NXT. I have faith that they're going to do right by them, by the fans, and it's going to be an entertaining watch. Plus also we're going to get matches with Roderick Strong and Adam Cole. I mean that, come on, give, here's my money, take it. Um, but if you put that same kind of undisputed era bickering back and forth and they're on the main roster, it's going to die a slow, painful death. Yeah. No, you, you, dude, you, you, you're not wrong because they wouldn't be able to. And I think that the perfect thing you've said there is, I don't want this to happen. And as soon as you start thinking, it means you're invested. You are invested. I don't want them to break up because of X, Y, and Z, right? That's all we need. Whereas if I told you that the Usos, and we love the Usos, you'd be like, well, okay, 
You probably, you probably think to yourself, well, that's a bad idea, but whatever. Do you know what I mean? Because it's not the same. You don't have the same connection with them because you're not allowed to. You're never given the opportunity to because they're doing stuff like rubbing cream onto people's testicles or whatever that was. I still don't really know what that was. But <laughs> yeah, somebody made, yeah, somebody made a mention. It's like the same thing from 2004 with, um, was it Christian and Chris Jericho? Yeah, the ass cream, yeah. Yeah. I tell you, it's the, like the same. I think that the difference with that was is that that was one segment on a show where there was a lot of other good stuff on it, or at least through a period where people were enjoying the show. I don't think anyone would have minded as much with the revival thing if Raw kicked ass. They would have been like, well, that was stupid, but what about this, that, and that? Right, and Raw can still be a good show. We had a show a couple of months ago, the one where Batista came and attacked Ric Flair. There were other stuff, and Roman Reigns came back from his leukemia. You know, We consider that a great Raw, and that was a great three hours of television for the most part. Um, so you can see that they still are capable, but you know, the creative probably are burned out from WrestleMania still. And, and here we are going into money in the bank, which is a big product, a big, you know, pay-per-view that everybody gets excited for. I do. I'm going to stay positive and hope that all this bad booking we're getting right now is going to be wiped away because we're going to have money in the bank, which is, always been a great show we've always enjoyed the money in the bank ladder matches we're getting seth rollins versus aj styles C- come on yeah no exactly man exactly there, there's nothing wrong with that at all right and hopefully it hopefully it all works itself out in the end indeed uh the last thing we will talk about before we wrap this up is a little thing that just popped up on my timeline i always like to talk about it apparently in the wrestling observer newsletter this week it says regarding becky lynch in the 2020 wrestlemania plans the one thing we've been told and obviously wrestlemania is basically a year away so take this with a pinch of salt is that the opponent plan right now is not stephanie mcmahon it is not ronda rousey although if rousey wanted it she could probably get that spot or charlotte flair so my man I ask you this, who, right now, and it would change a thousand times, but who, as of today, May, whatever it is, early May, 2019, should and will, will's not fair, but you know what I mean, Becky Lynch take on at WrestleMania 2020? Who on earth could WWE have in mind if there is indeed already a speculative plan put in place? Alicia Fox. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was hoping for. That's what I wanted. That's what I wanted. I really don't know who it could be. I have no idea whatsoever. None. I, honestly, for me, the botch at WrestleMania was kind of a blessing in disguise for them because they could continue that, that rivalry. Yeah, if they want to go I, back to it, they can, yeah. Yeah, they easily have a storyline they could go back to because it was a fluke and her shoulder was, Rhonda's shoulder was up and blah, blah, blah. So they easily could go back to it, and I think they should. And you said something about Stephanie McMahon. That would be, I if you know Stephanie's obviously, you know, in ring shape and everything. Let's get those two in a match because you, you're if you're going to make the comparisons of Becky Lynch to Stone Cold Steve Austin, you might as well have her go against the McMahon. <laughs> exactly, man. Why not? Eh? And plus, who? Remember, we were happy as can be when Ronda Rousey broke Stephanie's arm. I mean, let's do that again, but Becky Lynch, because we're really high on Becky Lynch. She's kind of faltered a little bit. I Again, that's creative to me, not her specifically. Um, I mean, I, I'm happy that they're get, having her face Charlotte because – I want her to have a great title reign. I like long title reigns with significant matches and significant people involved. Charlotte is as big as it can get right now, so you want her to face Becky to face Charlotte. Lacey Evans, we'll see. I like the look. I like the woman's rights finisher. There's potential there. I think it's a little too much too soon, but we'll see what she can do in the ring, and I look forward to it. Well, there you go. I couldn't have said it better myself. Alex, anything else you want to throw out there before we wrap things up? Uh, no, uh, nothing really. There Just uh, nice. I'm glad to be back on the show. Um, thank you for all that you do. I'm hoping I was a beacon of positive light for you on this podcast. Always, my friend. Hope we can do it again in the future. Dude, at do without a shadow of a doubt. As I always say, the more people that can come back on, the better. Uh, and again, you can come on. You can come on Simon's Pro Wrestling Podcast. You just head over to patreon.com 
forward slash Simon Miller 316 and it's all there. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Simon Miller 316. Hit up the YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash the Miller Report rules or just search for Simon Miller. That's free too. So if you haven't subscribed, please go do that now and go and subscribe to my brand new podcast, Why With Simon Miller, which goes live once a week too. Just me talking nonsense. I just like talking nonsense sometimes. I thought, well, if we're going to do it, I may as well do it on YouTube and podcast. Simple as that. Uh, Alex, thank you so much again for the support. You're a good guy all around. And that's it. We're done. Uh, that's it for the wrestling podcast for this week too. We'll be back next week on Wednesday, two p.m. Uh, sorry, one p.m. BST over on the YouTube channel live. If you want to join, thank you as always for all the support. Have great weekends. Enjoy any madness that is going to come from Raw and SmackDown, and I hope there's a lot because then we can talk about it. Thank you very much, and I will talk to you soon. <laughs>